we have stood quite openly and firmly for the right of that state to exist within secured borders. Uh, we certainly reject uh, the uh, label that has been uh, attached to this. We present meticulous evidence, rigorously researched. That the so-called facts in the report published by Amnesty this week are delusional. In early 2022, Amnesty International published a controversial report accusing Israel of apartheid. Our conclusions may shock and disturb. Along with the report, which was condemned and rebutted by the Biden administration, we reject the view that Israel's actions constitute apartheid. Jewish organizations and other NGOs, Amnesty also released a short video meant to promote its charges to a wider audience. And as a stand-in for the report, it does capture the spirit of the longer document. Just 15 minutes long, the video is filled with errors and falsehoods, distortions and omissions that tell us more about amnesty than about the Jewish state it slurs. Already in the 70s, alarms were sounded from the top ranks of Amnesty International over the organization's anti-Israel bias. After the publication in 1970 of a controversial anti-Israel report, Amnesty USA's own chairman, Mark Benenson, wrote to the Times of London to protest the organization's unscrupulous research. At best, the Amnesty report reveals the zeal of the prosecutor, convinced of the defendant's guilt, who perhaps without conscious malice omits from his brief material which would help the defense. Mark Benenson flies over to London with Theodore Bekel, Theo Bekel, and they go to the annual meeting and they say this report was, is, is a shanda, right? They say this report is a mess. It was um, not accurate. You betrayed your commitment to work with the Israeli government and the evidence here is still not conclusive and now you're politically compromised. Amnesty officials in Switzerland and Israel also condemned the report, while many Jewish members of Amnesty in Britain resigned. And just two years later, an especially high-profile resignation. This is an ITN news flash from the Olympic Village in Munich, where early this morning, armed Palestinian guerrillas raided the sleeping quarters of the Israeli team. After Palestinian terrorists massacred Jewish Israeli athletes at the 1972 Olympics in Munich, Amnesty's representative to the United Nations stepped down, charging the organization with moral obtuseness for spreading falsehoods about the Western response to the massacre while ignoring the Jewish victims. So now, 50 years later, many ask, has anything changed? Or has the organization's anti-Israel bias just gotten worse? In February 2022, Amnesty International posted its video to YouTube. Much of the video is proof by assertion. Apartheid, 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 apartheid. But what about the actual claims? the purported facts on which Amnesty makes its case. A closer look at the video reveals that it overflows with accusations that are egregiously false, distorted, and designed to mislead the audience. Which raises the glaring question. If Amnesty had a good case, why would it need to manipulate viewers? Let's look more closely, beginning with the same evidence that Amnesty opens with, a pair of quotes by Israeli prime ministers. Well, Israeli leaders have been clear about their intentions from the beginning. In 1948, just before he became the first prime minister of Israel, Ben-Gurion visited Lifta and other Palestinian areas near Jerusalem that were completely emptied of Palestinian residents following attacks by Jewish forces. He stated, there are no Arabs, 100% Jews. If we persist, it is quite possible that in the next six or eight months, there will be considerable changes in the country, very considerable, and to our advantage. More than 70 years later, then Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu posted on Instagram that Israel is not a state of all its citizens, but rather the nation state of the Jewish people and only them. Both quotes are distorted, ripped from their context to trick viewers. Amnesty doctored the Netanyahu Instagram post by cutting and concealing the very next sentence in which he says, there's no problem with the Arab citizens of Israel. 
They have the same rights as all of us, and the Likud government has invested in the Arab sector more than any other government. And what about Israel being a Jewish state with equal rights, as the Prime Minister noted? That's hardly evidence of apartheid. It's what the UN called for in 1947. It's what the international community supports. Meanwhile, Palestinians must recognize that Israel will be a Jewish state. And it makes Israel the single tiny place for Jewish national self-determination alongside an Arab state, an Arab Republic, an Arab Islamic state, an Islamic country, an Arab Republic, an Arab state, and an Islamic Republic. Amnesty hardly does better with the Ben-Gurion quote. First, although Amnesty claims the context of this February 1948 quote is attacks by Jewish forces, Ben-Gurion was actually speaking during and about a time of attacks against Jews by Arab militias. Arab opposition to the partition scheme has been violent. The call for a holy war against the Jews went out from Cairo. Until shortly before five Arab armies invaded the Jewish state in May 1948, the main Jewish military force focused mostly on defensive operations in the face of Palestinian attacks. Although Amnesty pretends the Ben-Gurion quote is evidence of apartheid, and of Israeli leaders being clear about their intentions from the beginning. The text by Ben-Gurion in fact says nothing about the country's ruling system. Not a word. His speech was about surviving the war being waged against the Jewish community. Even worse, Amnesty conceals other statements by Ben-Gurion that were about the nature of the state. Just months before Amnesty's quote, Ben-Gurion said, In our state there will be non-Jews as well and all of them will be equal citizens, equal in everything without any exception. And just a few months after, we appeal in the very midst of an onslaught that has been raging against us for months to the Arab inhabitants of the state of Israel to preserve peace and participate in the building of the state on the basis of full and equal citizenship. Serious research wouldn't need to hide Ben Gurion's calls for equal rights, but amnesty conceals them because this isn't serious research, it's the zeal of a prosecutor. And Amnesty's dishonesty continues. 2.5 million Palestinians live in Israel and East Jerusalem, restricted to enclaves that make up around 3% of the entire area. This statistic, meant to dishonestly evoke South Africa's Bantistans, is both mundane and false. Mundane because in urbanized countries across the world, most people live on tiny fractions of the land. The same goes for citizens of Israel, whether Jewish or Arab. And Amnesty's claim is false because it's simply a lie that Arabs in Israel are restricted to 3% of the country's land. Cities and large towns that are 100% Arab take up 711 square kilometers, or about 3% of the land, which adjusted for population is more space than taken up by 100% Jewish cities and large towns. But regardless, Israel's Arab citizens are hardly restricted to those all Arab towns. Just like Jews, they can and they do live in Jewish majority cities like Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, Haifa, and Eilat, or lesser known communities like Nofa Galil, Ma'alot Toshicha, Ramle, Lod, Akko, and Metula and Carmiel, Nahariya, Tzvat, Hadera, Afula, Kvarsava, Netanya, Givataim, and Kharish. And that's without even taking into account small Arab villages, and small Jewish villages, where Israel's Supreme Court has enforced anti-discrimination laws to uphold access for all. The Supreme Court's ruling also makes clear that a related allegation by amnesty, that Arabs are barred from living in 68% of all towns in Israel, is flatly false. Another fake map in the video suggests that nearly all the land, everywhere Jews weren't settled, belonged to the Palestinians before 1948. In reality, most of that land was state-owned. Amnesty follows this up with more sleight of hand, using word games to confuse the audience and exaggerate Palestinian land ownership relative to Jewish ownership. The narrator says about Palestinians, Before Israel was established in 1948, Palestinians comprised most of the population, around 70%, and owned the vast majority of private land, about 90%. By contrast, he says Jews owned about 6.5% of the land. 
See the trick? They compare the Jewish share of all the territory to the Arab share of only privately owned land in the territory, a much smaller pie. It's a distorted apples to oranges comparison. Apples to apples? The Jewish owned share of privately owned land was more than double Amnesty's figure. Or put another way, the Palestinian owned share of all the land was well under half of Amnesty's claim. And here's yet another dishonest apples to oranges comparison. Jewish Israelis have only one ID card, with a status that grants them the right to live almost anywhere they wish in the country. They can move freely with access to health care and vast resources. Palestinians, on the other hand, have four types of ID cards, if any at all. The kind of ID card you are given determines the level of rights you can enjoy and controls where you can go and what you can do. Notice how they shift mid-passage from describing Jewish Israelis Jewish Israelis to describing Palestinians as a whole, regardless of whose passport they might hold. Palestinians, on the other hand. That's because an apples-to-apples -apples comparison between Jewish Israelis and Arab Israelis would reveal an inconvenient truth. Jewish citizens of Israel have one ID card, and Arab citizens of Israel have the same ID card. Jewish Israelis enjoy the individual rights that come with that ID card, and Arab Israelis enjoy those same rights. In other words, the ID card isn't based on ethnicity, as Amnesty would have you think. It's based on citizenship. And citizenship isn't divided along ethnic lines. And two million Muslim Palestinian Israelis like me. Gaza and West Bank Palestinians aren't Israeli citizens because they were never part of Israel, and they aren't immigrants. Turning to the West Bank, the video claims that there are separate roads for Israelis and Palestinians. Hundreds of Here again, Amnesty plays word games to push a falsehood. If Palestinian is used to mean Arabs living in Israel in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, which is how Amnesty uses the word throughout its video, three million Palestinians live in the occupied West Bank. Two million are trapped in the Gaza Strip. 2.5 million Palestinians live in Israel. Then not only is their claim about separate roads false, but their distinction between Israelis and Palestinians is nonsensical. What are the facts? Palestinians in Israel, as Amnesty describes them, can and do use the same roads as the country's Jewish citizens. Amnesty gets it wrong about Jerusalem, too. This blue ID is for Palestinians in East Jerusalem. They can travel to the occupied West Bank as well as to Israel, but they are not citizens of Israel. Contrary to Amnesty's categorical statement, while most Palestinians in East Jerusalem haven't requested Israeli citizenship, about 20,000 East Jerusalem Arabs are, in fact, citizens of Israel. And it gets it wrong about Gaza, claiming that it is subject to military rule. If you hold a green card, you are subject to military rule. And if you have a green card with a Gaza address, it means... Although Amnesty knows well that the territory is ruled by Hamas. Amnesty again misleads when talking about casualties of war. Between September 2000 and February 2017, Israeli forces killed 4,868 Palestinians in the occupied Palestinian territories, including 1,793 children, outside the context of armed conflict. This is false. To the contrary, the numbers absolutely do cover those killed in the context of armed conflict, including fighting during the Second Intifada, in subsequent rounds of intense battle, and operations stemming from the overarching conflict between Palestinian terror groups and Israel. As supposed proof of their apartheid slur, Amnesty states that At the end of May 2020, 4,236 Palestinians were held in Israeli prisons. When considering the population of the West Bank and Gaza Strip, this amounts to about 90 people per 100,000. Less than the incarceration rate of the United Kingdom, less than that of France, and way less than that of the United States. Referring to Israel's Arab citizens, who make up 20% of the country's population, Amnesty claims they were made citizens but can never become nationals and enjoy equality unless they become Jewish which the law prohibits. First, no law prohibits Arabs from becoming Jewish. Nor does Israeli law give a Jewish citizen individual rights that an Arab citizen doesn't have. But perhaps most absurd is Amnesty's claim that Israel's Arabs who are citizens cannot be nationals. 
A citizen is by definition a national, and Israel's nationality law made Palestinian Arabs in the territory of the state explicitly nationals. Amnesty knows this. Just three paragraphs after their written report claims Israeli law doesn't define Palestinian citizens as nationals, they quote the portion of Israel's nationality law giving citizenship to Arabs, including its reference to them becoming, quote, nationals. Here, Amnesty points to Israel's security barrier as supposed evidence of apartheid. And there's a separation wall and fences built around you since 2002, which Palestinians call the apartheid wall. According to accepted definitions, apartheid refers to inhumane attacks, for example murder, torture, rape, and slavery, directed at the civilian population to enforce a system of racial oppression and domination. Israel's security barrier, on the other hand, was built to protect civilians against waves of deadly Palestinian suicide bombing attacks. But incredibly, Amnesty's video, which attacks the barrier as an inhuman policy, says nothing about the Palestinian terror war that prompted its construction. The Israeli government approved the building of the barrier during the Second Intifada in 2002, after dozens of suicide bombings, like the ones that killed 21 people, mostly teens, at a dance club, 15 people at a pizzeria, 11 people at a pedestrian mall, 15 people on a city bus, 11 people at a bar mitzvah, 11 people at a cafe, 30 people, mostly elderly Jews, at a Passover dinner, and more and more. Amnesty pretends this period of brutal, incessant violence, targeting Israeli civilians, didn't exist. And why do they ignore Jewish suffering? So that they can pretend Israel's attempts to stop the attacks are really just an inhuman effort to oppress Palestinians. It's the zeal of a dishonest prosecutor, an ugly game of make-believe, a doctored picture. It's ironic then that other images from Amnesty's video tell a more honest story, as if trying to shout the truth from beyond the video's words. Here, Amnesty purports to show the life enjoyed by Jews. On the other hand, Israeli authorities have given the Jewish-Israeli population privilege over Palestinians in just about every facet of life. Let's look more closely. The street scene does show people enjoying their freedoms in Israel. Jews, soldiers, Christians, and Muslims. And it's not really clear what Amnesty wants us to conclude about the Tel Aviv stock exchange. But obviously, they don't want you to know that the chairman of Israel's largest bank is Samer Haj Yehia, an Arab Israeli. Or about the Israeli companies working together with West Bank Palestinians building bridges despite real tensions. And definitely not about the millions of dollars budgeted to encourage Arab success in the Israeli tech sector. But then, an organization that promotes 15 falsehoods in 15 minutes can't be expected to share inconvenient facts. We need to ask ourselves, why do they feel the need to lie? What kind of organization seeks to flagrantly misinform people and does so in order to demonize the Jewish state? Not one that should still be considered a human rights organization. <laughs> 